Hey, it's Mike Hambright with FlipNerd.com. Welcome back for another exciting VIP interview where I interview successful real estate investing experts and entrepreneurs in our industry to help you learn and grow. Today, I'm joined by my friend Ken Corsini of Georgia Residential Partners. He's a real, it's a real estate investing firm that Ken founded about 10 years ago. Uh, Ken has also just launched a real estate investing podcast, which we'll talk about as well. I know he's excited about that. And so Ken has multiple exit strategies. He's a wholesaler. He does turnkey rentals, rehabbing. He's even doing new builds now. And as you grow in your real estate invest investing business, it's important that you find multiple ways to generate revenue and be able to kind of evolve in your business over time as the market shifts. So Ken's going to tell us all about that today and how you can run a business that runs for years and years and years like he has. Before we get started, though, let's take a moment to recognize our featured sponsors. RealtyMogul.com is an online marketplace for real estate investing, connecting borrowers and capital from accredited and institutional investors. Get a rehab loan fast and close in as little as 10 days. Rates start as low as 9%. We'd also like to thank National Real Estate Insurance Group, the nation's leading provider of insurance to the residential real estate investor market. From individual properties to large-scale investors, National Real Estate Insurance Group is ready to serve you. Please note, the views and opinions expressed by the individuals in this program do not necessarily reflect those of FlipNerd.com or any of its partners, advertisers, or affiliates. Please consult professionals before making any investment or tax decisions, as real estate investing can be risky. Hey, Ken. Welcome to the show. Hey, Mike. How you doing? Yeah, good. Good to see you. Good. Um, Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, hey, I want to hear all about your podcast, and I know you, you, we've had some of the same guests. We run in the same circles because we're in uh, a, a similar mastermind, the same mastermind with uh, Jason Medley. But um, before we get started talking about your podcast and talking about all your experiences, kind of give us your background and tell us how you got started. I know, I know like me and a lot of other guests I've had on where refer to ourselves as corporate refugees. So we right. were working in uh, uh, a large companies and, you know, had enough of it and moved on. But kind of tell us your background and how you got to where you are today. Sure. So you're exactly right. I unplugged from the corporate world back in uh, 2005. So I came out of the University of Georgia with a, a business degree in uh, 1999. I went to work for Marshall McLennan, which is a big insurance brokerage, and actually did software consulting for them. And actually really liked the job. It was a good job, great work environment. But if you're an entrepreneur, you know that that's just, it's not fulfilling. And so I knew that I wanted to be a business owner and I really was drawn to real estate. So about 2003, 2004, I started just educating myself. And I actually, I mean, it's kind of funny. I actually bought a Carlton Sheets set. Yeah. One of those, yeah. you know, one of those sets that probably sold for $1,000. I bought it at a garage sale, unopened Cassette, for like $10. Cassette tapes? It was CDs. Oh, okay. It was CDs, but it had the booklets and everything. I mean, it was still shrink wrapped and I took it home and, uh, and, and unwrapped it. And I listened, I'm not kidding you, to those 10 CDs for about a year straight and just soaked up the information and absorbed as much knowledge as I could and just really fell in love with real estate investing and figured, okay, I got to figure out how I can leave my day job and get into real estate investing. And so and I, it's kind of interesting. Opportunity opened up where I bought into what you could almost consider a franchise. They were out of Seattle and they had put, to the, put together this program where they were training guys like me how to do assignments, where we would actually, it was an interesting model. We would find lease purchase tenants and then go find them a house and then partner them up with an investor that would buy the house for them. And in the middle, I created an assignment fee for myself. Hmm. I never bought the house. I basically just part, partnered two parties together. And, you know, that worked great in 2005. It worked great in 2006. Uh, I did about 75 deals over the course of two years, which was good. It was a good start for me. It was enough income that, you know, I'd left my job and had done okay for myself. But then in 2007, the market just tanked. And this business that I bought into went, went under. They disappeared. They closed up shop. So I had to make a decision. Okay, they're gone, but I've gotten some education on real estate investing. I know how to find tenants. I know how to find investors. What am I going to do? And so in 2007, I put together what we call the turnkey model. So I started a renovation company where we could buy distressed properties, we could fix them up, and then we would place these same lease purchase tenants into these properties, and then I would sell them to investors as sort of a turnkey deal where everything's already been done for you. Okay. 
And that business really evolved in over the, so many years since 2007 to where we are today, 2015. We're still doing it. It's still our core business is you know taking distressed properties, fixing them, putting tenants in them, stabilizing them, and then typically selling them to out-of-state investors as a turnkey investment. Okay. And so that's sort of been you know the last 15 years and how are, I got. Are to you property? Do you, do you property manage those, or do you hand it off to somebody else? Or? So we've. We've bur- that's a great question because we've burned through some property managers yeah. over the years. Because now we do, we'll do about a hundred deals in a year, and for a small property manager, that can blow them up. Right. And so we blew up a couple property managers over the years, to where about three years ago we partnered up and actually have an an equity stake in a property management company that can handle a larger volume. And so we've migrated a lot of our investors over to that platform to where now. It is somebody else's. It's a third-party platform for property management, but we still have a stake in it. And so we've got, you know, one of their uh, agents that sits in our office, that's in our, you know, in our meetings, so that we have a little more control over that property management piece. Yeah, with the, in the turnkey world, as you know, if you're selling to clients and then they have a bad experience with property management, you know, they're not going to be your clients for very long, right? Absolutely. Well, it's the linchpin. Yeah, it's the linchpin to turnkey investing, but it's the linchpin to, you know, long-term hold, you know, buy and rent. Uh, strategy. Yeah. You have to have a good property management company in place. Yeah. So based on you know what we're going to talk about today with bolting on multiple exit strategies over time, we can already see the evolution of where you started by kind of connecting people, but you were just making an assignment on it to taking yep. on a bigger role of actually finding the properties uh, and finding the, the, the tenants or the lease option people and putting those together and then selling them. So every successful real estate investor I know has you know some sort of similar story where wherever they are today is not where they started. They had to kind of ebb and flow with the market changes, and as opportunities yes. open up, they gravitate towards them. And yep. so, um, why don't you tell us? I know you're going to tell us more about your story, but just just tell us kind of how important that is. Share yeah. with our listeners how important that is to be able to be able to kind of adjust. Sure. Well, it's been it's been the only way that we've been able to survive because yeah. if you look. Over the last six, seven years, I mean, especially in Atlanta, where Atlanta, you know, tanked like everywhere else in the in the late 2000s. And then you've got all these changes happening in terms of lending guidelines. And so investors that were getting 100 percent financing, then they were getting 5 percent. And all of a sudden they were requiring 25 percent financing and and a blood draw. I mean, it just everything changed for us every year. And then in 2011, all of a sudden the hedge funds descend on Atlanta and gobble up all our inventory. And the REOs and the foreclosures start drying up. And so literally every year I feel like, okay, what's the big shift in the market that we have to adapt to? Right. And uh, I'm sure it's not just Atlanta, it's any market. I mean, the real estate market is constantly evolving. And so for us, we've had to stay on top of it and make sure that our business is staying relevant and changing. And sometimes it's hard, especially if your ship gets pretty big where you've got a handful of staff and everybody kind of knows their role. And all of a sudden you have to plug them into a different role and you have to buy different types of properties or you have to acquire them differently, which is what we've had to do. Um, you have to be able to make those changes. Yeah. And it's interesting because even I remember some of the big players in Atlanta in, two, in late 2000s, these guys that I looked up to and wanted to do business with, and they're nowhere to be found. They're gone. Yeah. They couldn't adapt and then so they're gone. And even the hedge funds, they came in, gobbled up a bunch of inventory, the market shifted and then all of a sudden they're gone too. Yeah, some of the some of the so I, I know you know I have a similar story. I know lots of people that were huge and now they're gone, and I'd say it was a combination or you know one of three things: they couldn't evolve and they were like a one-legged stool, um, or they relied too much on you know too few sources of uh, capital, so their capital got taken away and they're just dead, uh, or. They were so top heavy with overhead that when they had to change their business model, they just couldn't support their model. I mean, yeah. you probably went through some of that where, you know, you it, it's one of those things that in a good market, you tend to take more risk as an entrepreneur. You yeah. add more people, you're investing more, not just in houses, but in infrastructure and in kind of building. But then there's going to be a time when you when a cycle turns around where you just got to get lean. I mean, can you yeah. kind of share some of those experiences about cycles you've been through? Sure. So we're lucky. We've never had to downsize. Uh, for us, it's been a matter of having to quickly shift direction and focus and plug people into you know the right areas. So perfect example. Uh, 
sort of my right hand man who you met at the last mastermind, Dave, yeah. is we, we call him our general manager because he sort of so oversees everything where he used to be more focused in the field. He was out there sort of overseeing the crews and making sure, you know, that they, things were getting done in a timely manner. Well, when the market shifted and we couldn't pick up properties as easily as we used to, I mean, back in the day, you could pick them off of MLS or we owned HUD Home Store. We had special software we had developed for HUD Home Store where we, that was our bread and butter. All right. And that dried up. And so we're like, okay, we have to shift quickly. So I had to bring him in. I mean, at the thing he'd done for four years out in the field, okay, that's no longer your job. Your job is to come sit in the office and take calls from the direct mail that we just sent out and find these, you know, get these acquisitions from these off-market leads we're getting. And we had to do that quickly. And it wasn't comfortable. I mean, you know, for him handing off what he had done before to somebody else and learning this new skill of acquiring properties, it wasn't easy. It was a little bit painful, but we had to do it. To, yeah. In order to continue to acquire properties, we had to do it. Right. So we've been lucky that we've never had to scale back and get lean and, and lay anybody off. We've, and, and, and truthfully, our volumes continued to go up, but we've had to shift focus in order to do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so along the way, you were, you were kind of primarily a turnkey model, and then you started doing more assignments, I assume. Um, were you primarily doing assign? Were you, were you easing into assignments before you started rehabbing, or was it just kind of all at the same time? Or? Yeah. So the back in two thousand seven, things crashed. That whole assignments business, this with lease purchase, it just flushed down the toilet. Because mm. there wasn't an investor in the world in two thousand seven that was going to buy a house off the MLS at market value. Right. They dried up. Right. So for us, we had to buy deeply discounted properties to where we were selling them with a tenant, but we were also selling them with a lot of equity already in play. Hmm. So that, that sort of changed for us in terms of what we were buying and, and who we were selling to. Okay. Okay. And then when, when did you decide to start rehabbing on your own? Is it, I know we're kind of in much more of a seller's market now than we have been in, in many years. Um, but is that something that's kind of recent or is that something you've been doing for a while? Yeah. So we started the renovation company back in 07 and um, it's interesting. I actually sold that renovation company to a partner of mine, and now we subcontract all the, you know, all of our renovations. Granted, we have three full-time crews. They basically only work for us. Okay. But they're not like on staff. They're still 1099 crews, and so they've been with us for a lot of these same guys have been with us for years and years and years. But you know, just in the last two years, things have really shifted in Atlanta. And probably all over the country. I know in Dallas, you've probably seen it too. I mean, the prices are much higher than they were a couple right. of years ago. You know, we're really getting back to where we were before the crash. Right. And so as that shifted, you know, a lot of our turnkey investors um, started looking elsewhere for, you know, I, I think a lot of turnkey investors went to some of the secondary markets where the, the housing was still fairly cheap. Right. You know, price to rent ratios look better in theory, where I think Atlanta is still more of an appreciation play it's a little bit more of an equity play so the higher end properties that are appreciating well but maybe your price to rents aren't as good so our turnkey buyers slowed down that velocity slowed down a little bit but it honestly was okay because we got this great you know this great buying pool in atlanta now at these much higher prices so it was a natural transition for us to start flipping properties mm -hmm. just retail in fact last year half of our properties that we sold were just flip flipped on the on the on the mls okay you know, just re retail you're saying um, you, re you rehabbed them and resold them yeah okay. so we rehabbed them and just resold them retail not to an investor just to an owner Our occupant occupants, yep and it's because that's uh there was a high demand there is a high demand in atlanta right now for uh for housing right and so yeah it's a, it's a good opportunity right now to fix and flip in atlanta and so that's sort of where we've transitioned at least half of our business now is fix and flip and your next question is probably going to be about wholesaling well it's it's interesting so the way the way our business works you know we acquire a property and it sort of falls through this funnel of okay where is this property going to fit in right is it a turnkey property okay maybe Maybe it's a property for me because I'm trying to build a rental portfolio myself. Maybe I'm going to pick that one off for myself. Is it going to be a fix and flip? Maybe it's a little higher end. It doesn't make sense from a rental standpoint. So maybe now it's a fix and flip. If it doesn't fit anything <clears throat> or doesn't just, we don't need that certain type of inventory right now, then it kind of falls to the bottom like Plinko. And you've got, <laughs> you've got this wholesale property now that, okay, somebody would want this property, even if we don't necessarily want this property. And so now we're doing a little bit more wholesaling where we're sending it out to a list of investors locally to see if, Hey, this is something that you guys would want to buy. Yeah. Wholesaling has always been kind of our last option. 
uh, even though we've wholesaled a lot of houses, um, it yep. was usually something that didn't, it, it wasn't, I, it didn't fit. My first choice was I'm going to keep it as a rental if it fits my criteria. But most right. of the houses we've bought over time don't fit my rental criteria. And then it yep. was um, if I want to rehab it. And usually if it, you know, I have a pretty broad rehab uh, kind of profile of what I'm willing to rehab. And that's evolved yep. over time too. But yeah, wholesaling was always, we just, you know, we were fortunate to have access to decent uh, capital at decent rates. And so we've always preferred, and the, the Dallas market specifically has always been very retail friendly. It's, it's a hot market, it's growing. And so we've always kind of been a retail first shop, yep. unless it was just like a ghetto house that there's like no way we're going to even step foot in there. We're just going to make it go away as fast as possible right. or it was really high end where I didn't feel comfortable, you know, rehabbing at that level. But yeah, same yep. thing. Everybody has to, you know, I, I know some other really high volume people and I think where they've struggled over the years is they were wholesale first and if they couldn't wholesale, then they rehab it. And so, you know, what happens is exactly people, you wholesale your very best deals. You're, you're in the best parts of town and the ones that everybody yeah. wants. And then you get stuck rehabbing your turds that, uh, you know, are the most risky <laughs> ones. And so that's yeah. a dangerous model. Yeah, that's the, la the last thing you want to do is have to buy the property you're most uneasy about and right. wouldn't sell to somebody else. Right. Yeah, that, that's, that sounds backwards. Yeah, yeah. But And then I think another thing that a lot of uh, real estate investors, you know, they – a lot of – as you know, a lot of folks wholesale initially. Mm -hmm. That's how they get into real estate investing and they want to wholesale and they don't have to worry about having their own money. They don't have to worry about raising money. They just wholesale. But inevitably, you know, you're leaving money on the table – uh, in sure. some instances, and in, in many instances, you may not be able, there may not be enough meat on the bones to wholesale it um, and yeah. really make any sort of you know profit at all, but it could still be a very good retail deal. So you have to kind of pass on some of those deals you could do otherwise. Yeah. It's funny, I've never, we know a lot of the same guys that are big wholesalers around the country. And for me, I don't know, I'm, I'm like you, I can't see giving up these potentially large profits on a fix and flip. Especially yeah. if you've already got your crews in place, you've got some capital, granted you have to have some capital lined up. Right. But if you've got the capital, you've got the crews and it's a good deal, to me, I'm selfish. I guess I want to buy it and, and flip and fix and flip it and see how much money I can make on right. it rather than give it to somebody else. Right, right, absolutely. So at some point you, you started you started doing new builds. So tell us about that. Yeah, so again, Atlanta being a hot market, it's funny that the, there was a lot of um, lot inventory, just we call them pipe farms. You probably had them in Dallas too, where you know you had all these people that were developing, and then everything crashed. Well, then you had all these developments out there, and so there was opportunity to pick up lots really affordably. Well, in about 2011, 2012, I think people saw the writing on the wall that things were going to eventually turn, and so all of this lot inventory got gobbled up. Just, I mean, overnight, it was unbelievable. Mm. And you got all these hedge funds that sort of squatted on it. Um, but they're building on it. And believe it or not, we've worked through almost all of that inventory. And there's a house sitting on almost every one of those pipe farms out there. It's unbelievable. Wow. So there's just this pent up demand in Atlanta for new inventory. We've always been a growth market. We've always lived on new construction. Well, it stopped for seven years or six years. And so all these people had this pent up demand for, for uh, new housing. So I went ahead and brought on, um, a builder and believe it or not, I'm actually a licensed general contractor myself I got my master's back in 2009 went ahead and got licensed as a general contractor just knowing okay at some point down the road this is gonna come in handy right but sure enough now and now that I can we can pull permits and build houses on my GC license so I hired basically a superintendent to just run run new housing builds and so we've got a handful I think we got three or four under our belt a um, couple of sold we've got a new development we're doing maybe five or six more lined up so nothing crazy. We're not going out there building entire subdivisions, but the infill has been really good for us. Yeah. And even yeah. some of the infill we're getting, we're getting occasionally, you probably see this on your direct mail marketing. You'll get somebody that says, Hey, I don't have a house, but I got a lot. Right. Actually, we, we just did one where the guy's house had burned down so many years ago. He got a postcard, but he just was sitting on this vacant lot in an existing neighborhood in a really good part of town. Mm. We picked up this lot for nothing, built a house and it was a home run. And so That's being awesome. able to do some of this infill where the big builders that are in Atlanta right now, they're not after that. They want to pick up a track neighborhood and do the whole neighborhood. But if you're kind of smaller, you fly under the radar, which is sort of what we're doing, and you can do the onesie twosies, right. 
um, there's just a lot of opportunity for us right now to capitalize on. Yeah, that. yeah. So, so the interesting thing, you know, in all this conversation is that you, to use a cheesy cliche, you have lots of tools in your toolbox. That you know, if the market were to take a dip again, if it cycles down, you're going to stop doing the new building stuff probably, and you're going to yep. you know focus more on wholesaling because the retail market won't be as hot. And um, yep. just kind of share. I mean, what I want people that are listening today to get out of this in terms of a lesson is the importance of having multiple exit strategies and as the market shifts or your access to capital shifts or things happen, which is inevitable for all of us in real estate, yeah. that you sure. can adjust and you've kind of done, you know, everything to some point and you just basically, you know, pull out the tool that you need and that's how you operate for a while. I, I, it is a, it is kind of a funny cliche, but it is spot on. Yeah. I mean, that's really what you want to do is have a bunch of tools in your tool belt where if a house, and every time I pick up a house, we'll look at it from different angles. And a lot of times a house doesn't fit necessarily one model. I'll, I might pick up a retail house and say, okay, I'm gonna buy this house, but if it doesn't sell, I just miscalculate it. Can I rent this thing and turn it into a long-term rental mm -hmm. or maybe even a, a turnkey? Um, and I'm careful not to get a bunch of high-end flips going at one time because I don't want to be over leveraged and all of a sudden the market shift right. on me or maybe I miscalculated and I've got you know five five hundred thousand dollar projects out there that would really stink if uh you know if I couldn't sell them right so you're always looking at what's plan B if this doesn't work out what am I going to do with it right and and you, you just yeah that's part of running a business is you know risk management I was actually a risk management major yeah in school. <laughs> so I know all about managing risk and that's really what I mean as you know, as a, as a full-time business owner, you're constantly managing your risk. How much money am I going to have over here? And if this doesn't work out, what, what's my backup plan? Right, right. right. So. That's awesome. Well, how would you advise people, a lot of the people that, uh, uh, you know, we have a variety of people that listen to the show from people with tons of experience like like uh, you or I, uh, we have some, some great, we've had some great guests on the show and I know they're also listeners. We also have a lot of new people that are looking to get started and I mean what kind of advice would you give them on how to at least be kind of thinking about how to develop those tools because you did it over the course of years and you yeah. probably did it by just figuring it out on your own out of necessity but yeah. you know if you could talk to somebody that had they could learn from you and not necessarily have to learn from their own mistakes and trials and tribulations what what kind of advice would you give them you know, I think I think wholesaling is a great way to start. And then a lot of people say that because you're not necessarily buying the property, not putting yourself out there. You know, if the if you tie up a house and you can't find an investor, okay, so you didn't lose anything. You didn't buy the house and you know sink the ship. So wholesaling is a great way to get started. And then when you're ready to to step into buying and fixing and flipping, I think uh, partnering initially is a great way to get started. Yeah. You know, find when I was getting started, I kind of found who the bigger players were in Atlanta and I'd go, I'd go to approach them and say, Hey, can I sell these properties for you? And they'd say, yeah, sure. You can sell our properties for us. And I'd make a little bit something on it, but I would partner essentially with the guys that were the bigger players. And I learned from them. I sort of learned the business. I wasn't putting myself too far out there in terms of over leveraging. Right. And then as you learn the business, and you develop some capital, you know, cheaper. Again, you don't want to be out there with all hard money, you know, at five points, 15% interest and right, have 10 right. houses out there. You're going to, it's a horrible way to start. Right. So as you can raise cheaper capital and you sort of inch your toes into the water, um, then just get into fix and flips and, but ease your way into it. Right. And use, part, okay. use partners in the process. Yep. Yep. Well, Ken, I, I was hoping you could take a few minutes and just kind of tell us about, you, you've been in business for a, a while now. You've seen lots of different markets. Um, I know you have a young family. Just kind of maybe help share. Um, we've been talking about some things recently that I, I, I wanted you to maybe share with everybody. What real estate investing? I think there's a lot of people that want to do what we do because they see that it gives them freedom, uh, maybe financial freedom. That's probably what most people look at. You know, as you get into this, you start to realize how important freedom of time is, right? of Absolutely. having flexibility in your life, but maybe just take some time and talk to us about what it's meant to you. And, um, and maybe we can talk a little bit about, you know, how people, maybe some steps people can take to kind of move themselves in that direction of achieving some of those freedoms. Sure. Um, well, as you know, my, uh, my son was sick this last year back in 2014 and it was very difficult for us. It's very trying. It was over an extended period of time. 
But one of the things I can look back on and be thankful, one, is that he's in perfect health now. But I can also be thankful for the business that I was in because you don't even necessarily realize it at the time, but I'd set the business up in such a way that I literally stepped away for about five months solid. I mean, almost no involvement. And the business kept running. Their houses continued to get bought. Houses continued to get sold. Money continued to come into the business. And I was nowhere to be found. I was there with my son in the hospital caring for him. And to be able to do that... Um, is an unbelievable blessing because I, I and truthfully I, I, I was in a hospital ward for months and didn't see a lot of dads there there was a lot of moms and a lot of dads were at work right and so here i was one of the few dads that was consistently there being able to spend time with my son and care for him and bring him back to health and you know you can talk about the financial benefits of real estate investing all day long and they can be very good but the other side is if you set yourself up right and you put some automation and you do some good hiring you can also set yourself up for a lot of freedom in terms of your time and some flexibility. And it doesn't have to be because you've got a sick family member. It might be because you just want to be with your family right. and spend more time with them. And um, I know this is a cliche, vacation more. I mean, I, I hate to you know, push real estate investing because you want more, because it does. It sounds cheesy and corny, but, uh, but it's true. I mean, there's, I've been able to invest a lot more time in my family even just going on vacations or, or running away for a week and doing something fun with them, especially because yeah. my kid, kids are still young, we can do that. But if I was still in the corporate world, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have that sort of flexibility to do that. Yeah. Well, and the, and the other thing is I, I've actually set up my house now where I've got some property and I've got an office. It's a big warehouse that we've finished into office space that's up at the front of my, my property. And so when I go to work, I literally, I get in my golf cart, I drive up my driveway <laughs> and I go to work. That's and awesome. guess what? I mean, in the afternoon, afternoon, my kids get home from preschool and they come straight to my office. And so I get to see my kids literally every day in the middle of the work day. That's or I might awesome. come home and have lunch with them. Or, But who gets to do that? I mean, in the in the corporate world, that's such a rare thing. You know, people value going hard and traveling and staying, working the late hours. Well, that's not that's not me at all. I'd much rather be at home and be with my family and invest in my children while they're young and so I guess the, the long answer of is yeah. that you know, real estate really does give you the opportunity to, to invest in your family. Yeah, and I and I, I wanna I don't wanna take lightly the fact that in order to get all those things that you just said, you do have to have some systems in place and more importantly a good team, right? People that you can rely on. So maybe take a few minutes to talk about that because you know, I, I know there's a lot of real estate investors that get into real estate investing because they want those freedoms yet they yeah. just end up creating another job for themselves where they're doing everything and they can't get out of it yeah very true yeah. well you're right there's a lot of real estate investors if that they're the only guy that can do anything and i right. i've tried to set my business up in such a way is that to empower the people on my team and so i mean over the years we've uh we've made high we'll make a hire one year and then maybe the next year we make two hires to now we've got about 10 people on our staff who all sort of have their set roles. You know, we've got a person that does acquisitions. I've got a couple people that do sales. We actually have an in-house brokerage. So we have a, a broker that handles all of our retail deals. We have an office manager. And it's taken me years to kind of put all those people in place. But everybody has their role and everybody knows what they're supposed to be doing. And, you know, if somebody needs to write a check, I don't have to be there to write the check. If somebody needs to send a wire, I don't have to be there to send a wire. Mm -hmm. If somebody needs to make a buying decision, <clears throat> they might call me or they might just say, I know this is a house we want and they'll just buy it. It's taken years to get there, Yeah. but I've been very purposeful in setting my business up in such a way that it's not, it, everything doesn't fall on my shoulders. Right. That makes right. sense. And it's, it's paid off. Absolutely. Yeah. It's paid off. Fantastic. Well, Ken, um, we have just a few more minutes here. I want to talk about your podcast. I know you just launched a new podcast and uh, uh, I've listened to some of your shows Um We've had some of the we have many of the same friends, so I, I saw them on there. So we have this okay. kind of incestuous. There's this like incestuous podcast pool of people that just interview each other, which is 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 actually cool. It's cool that everybody gets along. I mean, we don't. I don't. I don't see it as competition. I don't think you know a lot of the guy. We know all the top podcasters for the most part. None of right. them see it as like competition. It's just like, hey, we're just talking to each other, and yeah. uh, so it's cool. But tell us about your tell us about your um, your podcast. Well, I appreciate that. I agree with you 100%. And that's one of the things. I've known a lot of these top podcasters. I've advertised on their shows. I've done bus tours with them. I've been involved. I said, you know, I know this space fairly well. I, you know, I'd always been attracted to it. It should be something, you know, sort of a natural fit for me. 
But I also, so I've been doing blogging for Bigger Pockets for the last so many years, really about four years. And so I've already been in sort of that content creation mode, which I really, I really enjoy putting my thoughts into a blog. It helps me sort of um, work through what I'm doing and, and process those things. And then I love educating other people and inspiring them. And so, yeah. again, it was sort of a natural fit to take this content that I was doing on Bigger Pockets and then to put it into a, into a podcast. And so the podcast is called It's Deal Farm. Deal Farm, and it's the website's dealfarm.net. And the whole goal for me is really to, to inspire people to do deals. We have a, half of our shows are where we interview guys like you, and, and you just share your best deal ever. Which for me, when I was starting out listening to guys who were doing real estate talk about these deals, to me was the most inspiring thing. Is you put that deal together, how? And that's so creative, and it was so interesting. And so we'll take a deal, one of their favorite deals, and we'll dissect it. We'll talk about it, what made it special. And, and they're short. I, I, I sort of wanted to keep these podcasts around 10 to 20 minutes, just yep. sort of the in and out, because I'm a busy guy. I know a lot of your listeners are probably busy. It's hard to get an hour podcast in. Right. And, and inevitably, in an hour, if it's an hour podcast, you're going to have some fluff and some filler. I just want to get in there and get some content, right. listen to it, and you're done. And we'll probably do two episodes a week, I think is kind of what we're thinking in terms of a release schedule. And we really want to build, I'd like to build a community of people that just want to share deals. So on our site, we have a place where you can post deals. You can you know, look for partners. You can look for investors. And selfishly, I'm hoping that it's an opportunity for me to do a lot of deals with you know, some of our listeners. Sure. You know, lend money to them or partner on deals or other. I just want to see people in the, you know, our listeners get together and, and do deals with each other. Yep. And um, you know, see where see where it goes from there. Awesome. Awesome. So dealfarm.net and then you're you're in iTunes under the same name? Yeah, that's right. Deal Farm. Awesome. Deal Farm. So yeah. guys check it out. We'll add a link uh, down below the uh, video here for those that are watching. So uh, Ken, hey, thanks so much for your time today. It's good to see you again and appreciate you being here. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. All right, buddy, it. stay in touch. All right, All right, take care. Are you a member of Flipner.com, the most robust real estate investing platform in existence? where you can find off-market wholesale deals and great vendors literally in your market. You can get access to advice from experts and learn about local clubs and events right in your backyard. If not, please visit flipner.com and register for a free account. You can register in less than a minute. It's pretty much the coolest site that's ever existed in the real estate investing industry. So get on over to flipner.com. 